Roscoe Carver stared at me, the look in his roomy eyes steadily moving from bored to puzzled, then to intrigued. I had been working at the Pineville Drugstore only a month, doing a short order dance during the morning shift with the cook behind the soda fountain and grill. We served up breakfast, mostly, with the occasional ice cream treats. This was Roscoe's first appearance in the Sunrise Crowd, having just returned from a long stay at the hospital in Gadsden after his last stroke. His daughter, Imogene, had told me Roscoe had eaten breakfast at the drugstore most of his life. He'd once had a store on the square and knew the breakfast hour was prime for new gossip and potential clients. Even retired, he still came, and he always made the drugstore his first stop after getting out of the hospital. Still stuck in the past, that man is, his grandson Charles had muttered, causing his mama to make a shushing noise at him. Charles, who gave a whole new definition to tall, dark, and handsome, had no clue how encouraging his words were to me. A guy stuck in the past was exactly what I needed, especially if his name was Roscoe Carver. I had searched the morning rush every day, dodging between the tables as I delivered plates of hot biscuits, gravy, grits, and an assortment of eggs, looking just for him. Now he was looking at me. Roscoe had emerged from Charles's beloved red 1992 Thunderbird like a king descending to his court. Charles sped off to work as Roscoe moved slowly into the drugstore, using a four-point cane for balance, weaving among the scattering of tables and acknowledging the dozens of greetings that sailed his way, the handshakes and the welcome backs. Miss Doris Rankin even rose from her table with the girls, and gave him a gentle hug. Everyone wanted to know where Imogene was, working too hard, and how Charles was doing, spending too much money and time on that Spencer girl. He moved his girth almost gracefully toward a table in the middle, and he eased down in the chair slowly, settling with a huff of air, as if getting off his feet brought serious relief. He rearranged the napkin holder, the cream and sugar, and the salt and pepper shakers, then leaned back. He clutched his hands over his stomach and looked around, ready to rule. He spotted me quickly, the new blonde behind the familiar counter. His glance skirted over me head to toe at first, then he sniffed, as if testing the air, and settled in for a long examination. I set a thick white mug down in front of him, extending the silver and glass pot that had become the morning extension of my right hand 